from fabulous Las Vegas, Nevada, this is Pod Therapy. Real people, real problems, and real therapists. If you have any questions you'd like to ask or advice you'd like to give, come on over to podtherapy.net and join the conversation. We have a great show prepared for today. We'll see if we can answer some questions, and if we have time, we're going to see if Jim is ready to process his resentments towards the Las Vegas Aces. (laughs) And now, broadcasting from not Level 9 Studios, that guy is Dr. Jim Jobin. I'm Nick Tangeman. It's time for some pod therapy. Well, it is Therapy Thursday, Nick, and I guess if we're going to deal with my problems with Las Vegas' only WNBA team, uh, this is the place to do it. I just want you to stop tweeting about it. Dude, it is bitter, isn't it? It's getting <laughs> yes, dark. It's every, yeah. It doesn't stop, and yeah. ev- things that have nothing to do with the Las Vegas Aces, you're tagging them I have them in. everything to do with the Las No, they know They know at this point. The Twitter guy or girl who, who actually runs that account, I feel really bad, because they're probably like, dude, this guy is like, they probably red flag me. Uh, <laughs> it's like, if yeah. he ever checks in at a game, like, <laughs> pull him you over to security. You are coming off a little psychologically unhinged. Yeah, well, that's fine, because, listen, I'm proud of myself on this. I for real i really am because i treat that team exactly as i would and do all other teams that i have a vested interest in like i am constantly yelling at teams online that i'm disappointed in and i'm pissed off because this is their first year it's a professional basketball team we got them and they are the first WNBA team in history to not show up to a game and forfeit a game. And the reason was because they they had to do a lot of travel. Like, they got stuck on planes and it was this kind of nightmare. And they didn't feel that they had gotten enough sleep. And so they did not play the game. And so the stadium personnel and all the tickets sold and the other team and the television networks and everybody that showed up just had nothing. And they forfeited it. That alone really made me mad. And then we lost the playoffs. We didn't get to go to the playoffs, by and we missed game. it by one game. Yep. <laughs> and so I was like, damn you, Aces. Okay. So, yeah. So, okay. So okay. let's just take the next uh, yeah. right. 15 seconds, yeah. process what you need to process, process and then let's <laughs> drop it and move on oh, I'm not for the rest on. of our no, lives. That's not going to happen, so we may as well just move on with the All script. Right. Moving on. Yeah, so we will talk about uh, not resentments today, but we have some interesting research. And, uh, oh, before we jump into that, if you are a patron at patreon.com slash therapy, uh, you have the option of going over to that uh, site or use your app, and you can actually listen to the uncut, unedited version of this cast. It has a special staff meeting uh, in the beginning of the show where we deputized all of our Patreons uh, into our work and uh, asked them important questions about ScoopFest to get their feedback on some things and discussed some of the uh, Patreon-only things that we're going to be doing online. And then at the end of the show, uh, after the show, there's going to be another special segment for the Patreons uh, where we are going to play Catchphrase, Nick. And uh, I'm yeah. really excited to... We really should have talked about that ahead no, of time. No, no. These are not discussions. These, these just happen. <laughs> so it's going to be okay. a lot of fun. So, yeah, if you are a Patreon, feel free to go over there. But let's take a look at the uh, the research that came out. So this new research talks about how first impressions often go differently than we think. So the study was published in a, a journal that's part of the Association for Psycholo- or Psychological Science. And uh, doctors Erica Boothby and uh, from Cornell, boo Cornell, and Gus Cooney from Harvard, boo Harvard. I hate anybody that's from a better school than me. Uh, they led the that's research. Pretty much everybody. everybody. <laughs> <laughs> you go to hell. <laughs> we sun devils are a proud bunch. Uh, no, but these guys wrote this, uh, this, this piece and they did this research. And they analyzed a phenomenon that they call meta-perception which is when we imagine how other people perceive us and whether or not they like us. So that ability we have to sort of uh, uh, run a little simulation in our mind and imagine how we came off to somebody else through sort of their mind, um, that's called meta-perception, and that's what they were testing. So they did this study where the researchers paired participants who had not met before, and they tasked them with having like a five-minute conversation Uh, featuring like typical icebreakers, right? So where are you from? What are your hobbies? That kind of thing. At the end of the conversation, the participants answered questions that gauged how much they liked their conversation partner and what they thought their conversation partner 
um, or whether they thought the conversation partner liked them. So on average, though, this is interesting, the ratings showed that participants liked their partner more than they thought their partner liked them. And since it can't be logically the case that both of you believe that you liked the other person more than they liked you, you're both pretty much wrong. On average, they the, the study concluded that they were discounting and they were not accounting for their partner's uh, enjoyment of them. They were misinterpreting the signals and they were missing signals altogether. And so they thought that the first impression that other people had of them was very bad. And then they did a separate study uh, where the participants reflected on the conversation that they had had. And according to those ratings, they believed that the moments that mattered during the, the encounter they had with their conversation partners the only moments that mattered were the negative ones. And those were the moments that probably shaped how the other person saw them. So it was a very negative takeaway. So the conclusion of the study, Nick, the uh, the authors sort of wrote up a couple of things and they, they described this problem of uh, meta perception. They described their results as what they called the liking gap. And, and so they figured out that there's a gap in our ability to detect how much other people actually like us. And so they said it like this. Here's a quote from the article. They said, the liking gap uh, works very differently than other kinds of things. When it comes to social interaction and conversation, people are often hesitant or uncertain about the impression they're leaving on others, and they're overly critical of their own performance. They seem to be too wrapped up in their own worries about what they should say or did say to notice the signals of other people liking them, which observers of the conversation can see right away. So it's pretty interesting, right? Because I think that's something that, A, is is interesting research. Like, I'm I'm interested in it as a nerd. But B, I've lived that. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) I I mean, anybody who has gone in for a job interview can relate to this experience where you go in there and... Um, I, there's been some interviews that I went into where I felt like, yeah, I nailed it. I made a really good at first impression. I think they really liked me, but there's several of other interviews that I've done where I left that thinking, ah, I don't, I don't think I, you know, I did, that wasn't my best version of me. Right. I didn't do, I don't think they liked me. Oh, yeah. Um, and so or reading their face, right? Like that, cause in interviews, especially you have to monologue. Like, it's not just like one sentence, one sentence. Like it's more like, so Nick tell me about yourself right and it's like okay summarize all that i am in a cup i remember one of the weirdest interview questions i ever got i was sitting across from this doctor oh dude it was so weird so I, i'm meeting with uh one of the chiefs of this company we're having this long talk it's very good we're back and forthing and then the the, t- the tippy tippy top chief of the entire organization he literally owns it he's the psychiatrist and he's korean and he walks in and he's an elder gentleman he's in his 80s and he walks in silently and uh, he's like ushered over to the desk and he sits down and he looks at my resume and the room is absolute silence for like 10, 15 seconds as he just mulls this over. <clears throat> and then he looks up at me and he goes, Jim, what kind of person are you? And I was just like stunned into silence. <laughs> like I did right. nothing. I was like, ah. Uh a good person (laughs) like he caught me so off guard and i walked out there and thought oh this dude hates me (laughs) i look like an idiot it's weird how the easy questions like that or the very basic questions are the ones that stump us oh dude we're prepared to answer all sorts of crazy stuff but yeah it's questions like that that throw us off so basically looking at this it sounds like we fixate too much on the other person and right. looking at their reactions to stuff that we don't catch other small signals that they're sending us right that show that they are interested and mm-hmm. that we are making good impressions so we we tend to leave those interactions with a more negative view of how we did right and it's not just interviews which are obviously high pressure but what the study is showing us is that it's the first impression factor, right? It's whenever you're invited to go out with your friends and there's a new friend there that you've never met before. and uh, Or, you know, this weekend you and I went to a football game and, you know, I, I, I had family members there and brother-in-laws and stuff. And you didn't, you know, have to like sit down and get to know any of them. But had you have to, that or had to, that would have been a first impression, right? You know, mm-hmm. and I think my wife's met Laura before and all that stuff, so it wasn't 
you know, we didn't have a whole lot of first impressions, but that kind of experience where, you know, you sit across from somebody and you're at a dinner party and you're just like, oh, hi, um, how are you? Or Tinder, you know, whenever you're really meeting somebody for the first time. What this study teaches me is that we have this self-critical problem inside of us where we really closely scrutinize the entire conversation. I mean, I don't know about you, but I run it back like mm-hmm. on a loop. The whole drive home after the encounter, I am like every single word that I said, scrutinizing it down to like the atom of the details. And I am always like, oh, God, that person must think I am such a joke. Like how I said this or or laughed at that or, you know, thought that this was a good idea. And like that self-criticism is is so big. But the study's saying, no, you're wrong. People like you more than you think they do. So this gap between those two is interesting because we we think of that as being kind of a first impression thing and it's just this one moment that it happens. But in reality, um, the research, the study finds that this gap, the liking gap, actually endures for several months. It's not something that is just related specifically to that one moment. Um, so they looked at, uh, I think in their study, they looked at college roommates And they studied this over a long period of time, and they found that even several months after they had first uh, met each other, this liking gap continued to exist. Yeah, even though they've known each other for a while, there's still that perception that the other person really doesn't like you. Mm -hmm. And I think we do this in romantic relationships, too, because, like, the study's geared to friendship, right? But I think that this is very common, and I think as therapists we've seen this a lot, where the other person or, or couples will come in and they'll say, you know, I'm not sure how they feel about me. I'm not sure if they're in this for the long haul. I'm not sure if they think about, you know, not being with me or they find me pretentious or annoying or or exhausting and they're tired of me. And, you know, over time, those kinds of things can happen. But more often than not, one part of the couple is saying, no, I really do love you. (laughs) Like, I really do like you. And you have this this self-negativity that you're dragging yourself down with. So, you know, this, this, I think, also, Nick, you know, pivots us to a really good question, which is, You know, how can we address that over self-critical mindset where we really scrutinize ourselves and and really imagine that others don't see us in a positive light? And I think as a follow-up to that, you know, let's talk about the bigger picture of first impressions generally. You know, like how do you come in and like shine? You know, how can you be approaching that? But I think first we have to deal with that self-critical voice. Right. I think... I mean, what I would take from this study and how I would really kind of apply it, I guess, to start with, it would have to be, you know, really kind of looking at um, remembering the results of this in that first impression and realizing that within that moment, I'm not going to pick up on certain cues that I normally would. So just to to start with, to, to kind of decrease my expectations of being able to recognize signals from other people that... I am understanding that I am more likely to interpret my first impression as being poor than to be good. So that kind of takes a little bit of the pressure off. Yeah, but then normally, knowing that helps. Right. And then I think on top of that, I think for first impressions, whatever helps you feel confident, do that thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I think... Juggling. Uh, yeah, or yeah. if it's not <laughs> it's socially appropriate <laughs> to be juggling at the moment... Other things like, uh, you know, the way that you look, you know, dressing nice. You know, I always, even if I'm just going to the grocery store. You always wear an ascot, laser, yeah. open yeah, shirt, you, <laughs> with open a button-up shirt with a pipe. With a pipe. Um, because you never know who you're going to run into. Yeah, And, and then so you, you you're that guy that gets in line behind 10 other people so that you can check out with a human. Even though there's nobody over at the self checkout, because by God, they're actually, gonna notice this ask God. yes, that is kind of funny. <laughs> Not because of the, that, but because I, I, when I get a lot of vegetables and stuff, I uh, hate trying to look oh, stuff up look and all up. that. So I just like you guys know what you're doing. Just ring this. That's stuff funny. Up. I actually saw something on Reddit the other day. It was a shower thought, and it said um, older people. Uh, will wait an extra 10 minutes in line so they don't have to deal with technology. Younger people will wait an extra 10 minutes in line so they don't have to deal with people. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's definitely true. So yeah, that's definitely true. But I, uh, I like that point. Another, that another what you're strong at. Yeah, another little trick that I've learned um, in first impressions is to throw out a compliment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I really believe in that. So when you're meeting somebody for the first time, find one thing that you can compliment that person on. Yeah. Because when you do that, they're automatically like, oh, 
Oh, mm-hmm. thank you. And they, mm-hmm. they start off looking at you in a good light. Right. And then once you've established that, everything else, like through that uh, cognitive bias that we have, right? That right. confirmation bias. Yeah. We're more likely to look for things that support our belief than disprove it. So if you start off with a compliment and you say, wow, this person makes me feel good. Right. Then now everything else goes through that filter. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I I, I don't know that in my encounters um, that I feel super comfortable complimenting, and and I don't know maybe it's just because I'm 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 running this through multiple things in my mind, right? Like I'm running it through times that I've met your friends or, or well, things like that, but also like encounters with patients, and I don't always lead with a compliment. You're, you're thinking might not be you're thinking style. too big. Okay, okay. The compliment doesn't have to be like, "Wow, you've got beautiful eyes." <laughs> okay, I mean it, it could be just something like <laughs> something some, really odd. Yeah, something. Yeah. I love your skin. Can your I breath touch it? is amazing. <laughs> no, I, you have really it, moist skin. What? It could be something just like, "Oh, I love those shoes." Yeah, those are great, great shoes. Yeah, where'd that. you get those? Yeah, or, those okay. are cool. That's fair. And I usually try to do something. I think as a therapist, we're engaging, right? So, as, like, that rapport is something we do quickly. Right. And as a funny anecdote, so when uh, we did our fantasy draft. Yeah. And so uh, one of your friends, uh-huh. uh, Eddie. Eddie, yeah. Um, yeah, you guys are going to go golf. Yeah, we, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, which I, I've met him before, but yeah. we, don't, we don't know each other that well. Right, right. But when, uh, you know, I've grown the beard since the last time I saw Eddie. Oh, yeah. And so when we got there... And, uh, you know, I sit down next to him. He's like, wow. He's like, that beard great looks beard. great. It's coming really <laughs> yeah. And ever since that moment, it's like, I like it. I like it. Yeah. He has he's, good taste. Know, like, every, every pick he had on his team, yeah. I was like, that's a great pick, Eddie. I agree. <laughs> I, I think that, I think there's, there's, there's a line of reasoning there that I want to jump on. So for me, I don't know that I always lead with compliments, but I do want to put the other person at ease. And so, and I think that's also the therapist in me, right? Is that... When I first meet somebody, I realize they're walking into my office. It's intimidating. Um, they're obviously going through a hard time. They're they're not coming to see me because they're on a winning streak. They're coming to see me because there's a problem. And so one of the first things I usually do as a therapist is try to put people at ease. And I, that's usually just small talking and um, bringing up things to kind of get them out of their own head. Uh, and I'm very cognizant of my own presentation, right? Mm-hmm. Lots of smiling. Um, I'm very aware of my face, like, you know, raising eyebrows and being interested. Lots of eye contact. But also, like, mirroring some of them, right? Like, I'm, I'm paying attention to the emotions that they have. And this is called personality mirroring. Maybe you've heard of it. Mm-hmm. But you notice in the other person what they're expressing. And you reflect as fast as, you know, you kind of can in a natural way that same sort of emotion. So if they're telling a story and they're kind of getting angry, you're kind of like, yeah, leaning in and like furrowing the brow and kind of like, yeah, no, I get it. Focused, right? But if they're like, you know, kind of like, yeah, this is great. You know, oh, I love being here. Buffalo Wild Wings is a lot of fun. Last time I was here for, you know, my, my buddy's birthday, we had a great time. And then you're, you're reflecting that, right? And so I intentionally do that. It's something I now do by second nature, um, which I've noticed helps me join with people. It, it just helps them go, okay, Jim gets it, right? And so the, whenever I come into a first encounter with somebody, my hope is that when they walk away, if somebody were to ask them, do you feel like Jim got you? Do you feel like he's the kind of person that understands you? My hope is that they go, yeah, no, Jim, Jim's on the level. You know, Jim, yeah, I could see myself hanging out with Jim because he, you know, seems to dial in. I definitely felt like he was with me and we were hanging out. This is good. So I guess that's my, you know, advice besides, you know, I I like your idea of complimenting Mm -hmm. too. Just, um, you know, it's kind of creepy. So there's that. It's not creepy about it. Super creepy. Super creepy. (laughs) This is... It's normal to compliment people. It's not, Just because you don't you know, do it You get to the football game, normal. you look at my wife, and you're like, your beard looks so good. And she's just very hurt, you know? And, like, you know, we were talking about it the whole time afterward, and she was like, God, you know, I mean, I'm so insecure about it. And I was like, baby, your beard is beautiful, okay? You don't let anybody take that away from me. It's you. not my fault if people can't take a compliment. <laughs> That's right. That's the real problem here is that she's yep. compliment averse. Well, very good. And, uh, yeah, good research, guys. So just keep that in mind that your encounters with other people, no matter if it's a first impression or multiple encounters, if you walk away and feel really self-critical, you're you're just sure that they didn't like you, you – the, the science now says you are overthinking it. You are overcritical of yourself. And the data shows us that most people enjoy conversation partners and that they do not take away negative feedback from you and, and, and have a negative perception. And then, you know, there's some tips in there about 
uh, how you bring your best self to that encounter and um, be complimenting, be warm, be affable, and uh, try to reflect, try to understand the other person. And, and I just recommend really dialing into them. I, I hate to see people pulling out their phones and looking down during a conversation, you know, and glancing away. I like to see that kind of stuff go away, especially in a first encounter, you know, like oh, really yeah, get to know them. Definitely. Yeah. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to discuss friends with benefits moving into a relationship. You're listening to Pod Therapy. Hello, Jim and Nick, and hello, Therapout. Today's episode of Pod Therapy is sponsored by me, Smitty Scoop. Hello, Smitty Scoop is just my ice cream social name. Nick and Jim, you should probably call me Smitty Therapout. I don't know much about mental health and don't have much to offer there. That is why I enjoy listening to Pod Therapy. If you're a new listener to Pod Therapy, I'd like to take this opportunity to recommend some of my favorite episodes from the back catalog. Episode 32, there's a great discussion of gaslighting. Spoiler alert, it is an overused pop culture media term that has become essentially meaningless, much like verbally abusive. Episode 23, there's an excellent discussion about opioids and their pernicious effects. It was so well done, I had my 11-year-old daughter listen to it. So I figured she's more likely to take advice from a stranger than she is from her own father. Also, if you haven't listened to episode 474 of Ice Cream Social, where our, the guests are none other than Jim and Nick, I recommend that to you as well. I look forward to seeing as many therapists as I can at the Sushi and Saki Therapy Session during Scoop Fest. Nick and Jim, this is your subtle hint to finalize the date and time. It looks like Wednesday dinner or Thursday lunch are the best opportunities for an opening on a Scoop Fest calendar. Uh, that's all from Smitty, the president of your Virginia fan club. Thanks, Smitty. If you'd like to join the party and help make the show possible and tap into the special content for patrons only, you can go to www.patreon.com therapy and sign up. Again, that's patreon.com therapy. We're back. You're listening to Pod Therapy. Our next question is from somebody who's in an open relationship and wants a friend with benefits. Should I get a friend with benefits to meet my sexual needs when my girlfriend doesn't? Hello, doctors, and salt pork to you both. (laughs) (laughs) Salt pork? Salt pork. I'm a huge fan of the show and listen every week. It's the highlight of my day. Now on to my problem. My girlfriend and I have been together almost a year. In the beginning, we were just friends with benefits, but that turned into a relationship two months later, with her insisting it be an open relationship. She had another friend with benefits that she did not want to stop seeing, and I'm okay with that. In the beginning, she and I could not keep our hands off of each other. We had sex almost every time we saw each other. Occasionally, her other friend with benefits would come over to her house, and they would sleep together, and everything was going fine. Eventually, she told her friend with benefits that she didn't want to sleep with him anymore because she lost her desire, and she told me that this was because he didn't understand her sexual needs the way I did, and I could make her feel better than he could. I feel like we need to pause here and marvel at how awesome this must have sounded to hear in real life because it is so awesome. (laughs) Yes. Very Um, true. We should... Let's just end it there. Yeah. Let's end on a high <laughs> that, note. It ends on a Thank high you. note. There is Thank no problem. You, Congratulations. Great. All right. So here's the rest of the letter. It was around this time, however, that we started to have sex less frequently. We used to do it at least once a week or so, and that dwindled to around once or twice a month. I've tried talking to her about it, but she always has excuses about not having time or something or other. I love her, and she loves me too, but I have to get my needs met as well. Since this is an open relationship officially, I'm wondering if I should maybe branch out and find another friend with benefits to satisfy those needs. I don't really want to find another sexual partner. I'd much rather rekindle the magic that we once had. But I want my needs met, and I don't want to leave my girlfriend. Any advice you guys can offer would be appreciated, and thanks for your time. Effing you both in your beautiful faces. (laughs) Anonymous scoop. (laughs) Thank you, Anonymous. Um, Well, thank you, too. This is... uh... Um, very nice to hear. I'm glad that uh, we are the highlight of your day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Also seek treatment immediately. <laughs> <laughs> Just remember the suicide hotline. <laughs> it's going to get better. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, this is uh thank you for sending this in. This is a really good question. Um, yeah, I guess as, as I'm kind of looking at this, the, the thing that 
I, I think we just have to start with is the fact that fundamentally this relationship has changed. Right. It has it has changed dramatically from where it started. Um, there's going to be complications in that. Um, you know, from from her perspective, it went from you know friends with benefits to now this is a relationship. So it was something that was purely sexual and just let's have fun, so on and so forth. And now it's a whole different component. I mean, it's apples and oranges, right? Different. And so, yeah, I think it, it's difficult, but I think uh, expectations have to be adjusted appropriately. I think that makes sense. And, you know, I actually, so whenever I read this, Nick, I, I was like, okay, I think I have some good feedback. But then I thought to uh, a guest that we've had on our show uh, on the episode about the Las Vegas orgy, um, we brought in the curator of the Erotic Heritage Museum, Dr. Victoria Hartley, uh, or Hartman, rather, <laughs> Dr. Victoria Hartman. And um, she is a, a sexologist and, and just very, very intelligent when it comes to sexual relationships and sexual interplay. So I actually ended up writing her and saying, Good. hey, you know, I, obviously I took the name away from the email and stuff. But I said, hey, you know, can, do you have any feedback? And, and she did. She wrote back with a couple of notes. And so she said, um, hey, listen, you know, regardless of how two people are, those hormones wear off, right, over time. Right. And so that sexual attraction to each other is going to diminish a little, and, and she said especially in women. And, and so she cited some different studies that kind of demonstrated that. So I think that's one thing to keep in mind. You know, a lot of us tend to interpret it as rejection or a loss of libido or appetite entirely, and it could be the settling into the relationship. Mm -hmm. So this could really be the true normal, and before that it was sort of the fireworks. Right. Um, she also pointed out, and I thought this was a really good note, she said he needs to check first to make sure they still have a friend with benefits relationship because they may have fallen into monogamy and they haven't like renegotiated. So when he says, hey, officially we started on this, yes, but you've never cashed that coupon, right? And so right. it's time to come back and make sure it hasn't expired. Like make sure it's still valid. She has ended her last friend with benefit. You are technically in a monogamous thing So right there now. could have been possibly... It, kind of an underlying agreement, right? When she ended her friends with benefits that maybe relationship, it's all like, over, almost because we do that all the time in relationships where we assume do something person, and we assume like yeah. that this is a contractual agreement and we uh -huh. both understand this, uh -huh. right? But we never talk about it. Oh, that happens all right. the time. Like you know, like hey, I don't feel like going out Saturday. Okay. But does that mean that I'm not going outside? Yeah. <laughs> like, was that a declaration? Or are you just, like, letting me know the same way you let me know, like, I think I'm in the mood for iced tea. Like, that right. has no bearing on me. But we all know that's not how it works, right? In relationships, when one person sort of declares, I don't want anybody else but you, they could have an undertone of, like, right. and that's our new normal, right? So, and it's what you want, too, right? Exactly, whether you like yes. it or not. So that was a good note by her. She also pointed out that, you know... Uh, not all humans are monogamous. You know, there's, there is that ability to be, you know, polyamorous. But she also pointed out not all humans are polyamorous. And so she kind of compared it to bonobos and chimpanzees and how we go through phases, you know, where we might mm. want to be one or the other. And so, you know, that's, both are legitimate choices. And so she encouraged him to sort of check that out. And lastly, you know, she said, hey, but listen, at the end of the day, um, you know, she's kind of got to be a part of, you know, 100% of her 50% of the relationship. And if you don't feel that your needs are being met, you need to have a thorough and realistic conversation about that and let her be a part of the solution. And, you know, if you want to talk about friends with benefits, bring that to her. Try to rekindle it. It could be as simple as sort of reigniting the relationship and trying to, to bring that back. But, you know, Nick, I think that brings, you know, her notes there. A, thank you, Dr. Hartman. That was awesome. But also, I think it, it, her last point there really, I think, introduces a new part of the conversation, which is we can kind of get distracted on this and think, man, this question's all about friends with benefits and whether that's okay or not okay. If you guys have negotiated this into a consensual agreement, I have no problem and I have no mm -hmm. further real commentary about whether that's good or bad. I don't care. It's good for you, right? That's what's working for you guys. Mm -hmm. But I think her last note brings another question to the conversation, which is how do we rekindle? Even polyamorous relationships that have really exciting right. sex lives, they're writing in and saying, hey, that doesn't last forever. And Dr. Hartman says, yeah, because hormones. <laughs> like, it doesn't. So how do you rekindle that? Yeah, so I could see this being, like you said, kind of a bigger issue in that um, really I think it kind of comes back down to communication. And are we communicating exactly what we want to communicate? Because mm. um, you know, our anonymous listener could go back and say, 
Um, yeah, you know, I've been thinking about this, uh, you know, friends with benefits thing, and I'd like to continue to pursue that. Are you okay with that? How do you feel about it? Mm-hmm. When in reality, that's not the issue. Right. Right. So, so he could easily bring this up and start going down that road without really communicating what the true issue is, which is true. our relationship has changed and that bothers me. Right. I feel like our relationship needs to be rekindled. So however you choose to approach it, I would say, I would just encourage our listener to approach it from that honest standpoint and open communication of what the real issue is. Yeah. I like that. That's a really good note. And he says that, you know, he says that in the letter, like, Hey, plan a, if I had my druthers, I want more of her. Right. Plan B would be, you know, exiting the relationship and, and getting it elsewhere. And that was something Dr. Hartman had also pointed out in her letter back. And she said, Hey, there's always the risk that you might reconnect with that other person in your friends with benefits arrangement Mm -hmm. and you don't seem to have a history of having that like you seem to have been the monogamous one and so she risks you giving up on her entirely and kind of being a one woman guy Mm. and so that might be problematic you know for your girlfriend that she might say hey you know what I don't know you don't have a history of juggling three girls like you kind of stick to one and if if you're really going to audition another girl, I think you're going to replace me. Or there's that possibility anyway. So that was something else that sure. Dr. Hartman had brought up. But, you know, I want to talk about to anybody, regardless of – so this is where I'm, I'm zooming out from the writer himself, but also thinking about the greater audience. I think anybody who's been in a long-term relationship, Nick, whether that's heterosexual, homosexual, um, traditional monogamous, polyamory, whatever it is – I think it is a human condition to notice that sexual fulfillment can wane, right? And that sure. the sexual dynamics can, can uh, decrease. And as Dr. Hartman says, there's hormones that are at play here too. So there's a really good book on this subject uh, called Mating in Captivity by Esther Perel. And uh, you see her if you type Esther Perel into the internet. She's got great TED Talks. She talks a lot about sex and affairs and all sorts of things. But she writes this book called Mating in Captivity, which is specifically about how to rekindle sexual um, excitement in a long-term relationship. And basically the thesis of her book is that what makes something sexy is often the unpredictability of it, the mystery of it. There's Mm. something about it that is not just familiar to us. And, Mm -hmm. And it's that excitement of the other, right? And, and so there is this uh, expectation of, you know, the thrill of it. And she talks about how that's how a lot of people get seduced into affairs is because it's the call of the wild. It's the call of the unknown. And she talks about how in these long-term relationships, we can get so settled into the familiarity that exactly the thing which is causing us to feel loved and cared for and, and safe is making us non-sexual. And so right. she, she has these great lines in the book where she talks about, like, there is no sexuality and safety. And, and so it's weird because she kind of says, hey, the way that you rekindle sex is you have to rediscover mystery. And so she kind of brings that into the book of talking that through and saying, okay, here's how I want you guys to kind of reengage the relationship. Because a lot of therapists, Nick, will say, okay, sex is getting stale. Here's what I need you guys to do. I want you to talk about it. I want you to communicate. Communication is always the key. And what Dr. Perel would say is actually no. Communication is going to make enemy. it worse. Yeah, it's going to make it yeah. worse. Because you're over talking. Yeah. You're over talking. You're over normalizing. You're over familiarizing. You're over understanding. Yep. I don't want you to get each other better. I want you to get each other less. Mm. I want to create distance. I want to create mystery. I want to put a shroud of misunderstanding between you. Because if I can start to blind you to the full awareness of the other person, they again become interesting to you. And it's that fascination and that mystery that leads to a desire to discover. And that's right. what the sex is, is the pursuit of the unknown a little bit. It's a great book. So it's called Mating in Captivity, Esther Perel. Um, I have an entire presentation on this that I've given. And our Patreons could have gotten that if they would have voted for it. <laughs> <laughs> but our patrons all voted against the learning idea to be a specific benefit on Patreon. But so thank you pox for your on support. your houses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but thank you for your support. <laughs> yeah, t- Let's not beat up the yeah, people who all right, support all right, us. All right, this is Jim just, you know what, this is really about the aces. <laughs> I'm realizing I'm acting out because this is about the aces and my unsettled resentments. But no, to the writer, uh, Anonymous Scoop, 
dude, we love you, man, and thank you so much for writing in. Um, my encouragement to you is, A, yes, you guys do need to have a conversation because there's the interplay of your arrangement, and you need to check and make sure that's still valid. Um, but if your first desire is to rekindle the romance between you and your girl, um, I would like to see you um, engage the strategies in mating and captivity, which is to increase the strangeness and the distance and the familiarity um, to, to kind of diminish that a little bit, not in negative, hurtful ways, but mm -hmm. in these intelligent kind of thoughtful ways. And, and so I want you to, to consider what that looks like um, to kind of rekindle the mystery of the relationship. I think you'll notice that that actually increases some of the, uh, her libido and, and maybe even hormone levels. I'd be interested to know if that's how it works. But yeah, man, thanks for writing in. And, and to everybody out there, you know, this is a common human thing. Uh, you know, be encouraged that there's ways to address this. And just because it's getting a little stale between the sheets, that does not mean that the relationship is uh, powerless or cannot be improved. Nick and I would be out of business if humans couldn't change. Exactly. Thank you for writing in. That Thank was great. you for writing in. Okay, we're going to take a short break. When we come back, toxic mothers and how to deal with them. You're listening to Pod Therapy. Hey, Therapals, have you purchased your tickets to Scoop Fest 2018 Scoop yet? Scoop Fest. 2018. 2018. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we need to talk about sushi, psychology, and sake. Yeah! Uh, so we have some listeners. Some of our listeners are going to be there for Scoop Fest. Yes. So we are going to have a little uh, lunch. Yeah. We are going to do sushi at Naked Fishes Thursday, October 11th at noon. Again, we're going to have sushi and sake. Maybe if I could talk Nick into trying sake for Probably the first not. time. Uh, That's not the first time I've had Well, this. you need to have good sake for the first time. It's going to be at Naked Fishes on Thursday, October 11th at 12 o'clock noon. So, if uh, we are put in charge of organizing this, which I think is a bad idea, but we or can do it, yeah. <laughs> um, we need to know a head count. So, yes. if you're interested in joining Jim and myself and a few of our listeners for Sushi, Contact October 11th. by any method you have. Any you method have Twitter, whatsoever. Facebook, you can go to the Patreon and tag us, or you can just email us straight up at podtherapyguys at gmail.com podtherapyguys at gmail.com let us know if you're going to be joining us for Sushi, Saki, and Psychology October 11th at noon at Naked Fish in fabulous Las Vegas yep and let us know how many of you are going to be there and then I will make arrangements yep we'll get a table alright thank you and we'll see you at Scoop Fest we're back you're listening to Pod Therapy our next listener writes in about his toxic relationship with his mother Ooh. How do I deal with my toxic mom? I'm a guy in college, age 19, living at home with my parents. And forever now, my family, most especially my mom, hasn't been exactly what you'd call supportive. My mom, she's... it's bad. She's clear... it's clear she has mental illness, and this has severely impacted our relationship. When we were younger, she'd often go out to go out on the weekends and never come home until either late Sunday or even early Monday morning, leading to a big fight with my dad. Several times she has tried self-harm in front of us and once tried to jump out of a car on our way to school. It seems like she's projecting onto me. She'll make fun of me in a way an eighth grader would, making fun of my sexuality slash gender. I've always been a straight guy, basically calling me a slut among other insults used for women. This greatly amuses her. Also, she has me pegged as a bigot slash racist because apparently I support Trump, despite me saying I don't support anyone in politics at the moment and try to stay clear of that discussion. Meanwhile, her and my family will literally use racial slurs slash stereotypes. It's clear my mom has some content towards me, I guess she wanted a daughter instead. My disability, which is a speech impediment, has always been the go-to thing to make fun of. And if I get mad, they're just teasing. I got some money for school recently after giving them about $150 as well as paying for my textbooks since they took it without asking. But according to my mom, I didn't help them at all. I am an evil seed, full of German blood, a Nazi, and have no character. I didn't go to respond to what she was saying, so she got progressively angrier. I love to move out, but that's not an option for me. I don't have the know-how slash means, and she kept me pretty sheltered. Do you guys have any words of wisdom? Jeez, man. So, 
You know, Nick, whenever I hear somebody described as toxic, I'm often a little reluctant, right? Because it's it's kind of a, a weapon. It's an easy word. yeah, it's an easy yeah, word to throw around. It's easy. And and I wanna make sure that, you know, I understand what that means. Usually I'll say, Hey, the person isn't toxic, but the relationship maybe is. In this case, I'm kind of inclined to say, Yeah, this person is, is a toxic person. They're they're unwell. Um, your childhood was spent watching this person disappear on weekend binges doing God knows what. And, and it's a parent. You know, you're a child. You need your parent to make you feel safe. You need routine. And they're disappearing. And, and you're watching your father be upset with that. You're watching self-harm. You're watching her dive out of cars, you know, that are moving. And then she's tearing you down, you know. And I think that when a parental figure, you know, and, and I think moms have a special place. But regardless, it, when a parental figure tears you down, it cuts in a more meaningful and deeper way than I think anybody else can. There's a lot of folks that will remember every criticism their father ever, you know, had for them or every time that they were, you know, seen as less than by a parent or really taken down a notch. And so this is, I, I think, really toxic. And so my first observation is I at least concur with uh, it, that description of saying this is a toxic person. Something is going to have to be done. I don't know that we should just continue this indefinitely. Right. I would agree. And I think keeping in mind that this is there's definitely some mental health issues going on here yes yeah right i i think that would be the first thing that i would encourage our listener to kind of remember and keep in mind because like you said i mean any of this coming from someone who is supposed to love and care about you Mm -hmm. can make this very very hurtful and difficult to cope with just keeping things in perspective and realizing that uh, she may not be like this without the mental illness. That's true. Um, you know, and and it's unfortunate, and it's it's it really sucks that this is the hand that you're dealt. Um, but this is what you're going to have to probably deal with. I mean, as I, I think a big thing is you're going to have to find some way of coping with this to the best of your ability, yeah. realizing that she needs to get help. I think at 19 years old, that's a big part of this equation that I find interesting. So your whole life, you have noticed this, you have been fused to it, you have been a a minor, and she's your guardian. And so there is no way to get around it. And I think there's a lot of people, Nick, that I've met uh, in life or that I've treated in life who had a very dysfunctional family or had a uh, unhealthy home environment that was toxic and it was hard. And when they get to 18, 19, 20 years old, they're really looking forward to, to getting out of there. And it's probably in their best interest. Um, I really do think that that's probably a good idea in this person's case. But he does say that's that's not available to me yet. You know, that's not an option well, I can do. And that was one thing that stuck out to me, too, is that he writes that I don't have the means or the know-how. Mm-hmm. And that she kept me pretty sheltered. Yeah. So to me, I'm, I'm kind of looking at that. And I would really encourage you to take another look at that. Yeah. And really kind of challenge that thought process. Is it that you don't have the know how to do it? Right. Uh, or is it just a lack of confidence that you don't feel like you can? Yeah. Because I, I, people do it like people do move yeah. away from their parents and it can be done and it may you may struggle a bit at first and you're going to have to learn some new skills right but don't automatically close that door and yeah. say that it can't be done. i want to agree with nick on this nick that's such a good observation i'm so glad you brought it up to the writer i want to speak to you directly for a second listen kid we all felt like you feel in the sense that you feel uh out of your element you feel unprepared you feel scared and intimidated, and you still identify mentally as somebody who's probably, and I don't mean this in a derogatory way, but you still identify as a child. And you look at this grown-up world, and you're like, oh my gosh, I don't know how to adult. I don't know how to pay rent. I don't know how to do taxes. I don't know how to um, you know, manage my life. I don't know how to, to be on my own. I'm not prepared for it. Let me tell you something. That is how every single one of us started. None of us got special training. We may have had parents that gave us a few more tips along the way. We may have had opportunities to grow up a little bit sooner than you. But you are exactly where you should be mentally. And this is your season. This is your opportunity. 
you are correct that you are living in a toxic environment. Now, we're going to give you some tips about how you can deal with that and still be in that toxic environment. But there are a lot of folks just like you who have had to make the decision to exit a toxic environment because it is an abusive relationship, because it is unhealthy, and because they are being hurt and wounded and they have to make that decision. And a lot of times we can become codependent and we can become afraid and we sort of become subservient and our fear of the outside world is bigger than our fear of the person who's abusing us. And so we stick around way longer than we should. And I'm going to tell you something, kid, 19 years old, you're going to make it. If you step out right now, if you go find a Craigslist ad and find a roommate out there and find an appropriate amount of rent, if you take that first brave step forward out of this life, if you make your your plan and say, I'm giving myself a month to figure this out and I'm out of here, I'm saving up some money, I'm going to do the next right thing, you're going to be okay. You will find a way. Whether that's having to take the bus to work and, and you know be on a bus for five hours each way, whether that's having to save up your pennies and make it work, whether that's having to eat top ramen like all of us had to do at 19 <laughs> yep. you know, for a few years in college, whatever you got to do, you're going to make it. But I want to see you take that brave step forward. And I would add, anticipate making mistakes. That's right. You're going to. You're, you're going, going to. to make mistakes because that's how we learn. That's right. Um, you know, I, I'm still making mistakes uh, yeah, on my income taxes. Oh, there's and that. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know what? I learned a valuable lesson. Um, I it. will not make that mistake again. <laughs> but that's part of growing up. That's right. part of learning. You know, you're not going to be perfect. There's going to be some, you're going to make some really stupid decisions mm-hmm. and that's okay. But that's how we grow. That's right. So don't be afraid. Now, if you if you are in a situation, again, we don't know all the elements of this. It's possible that you're in a situation that is just not actually possible. True. You know, for you to exit right now um, or, you know, to whatever extent, there's, there's elements we don't understand. If you're trying to cope with a reality where you're with a person like that. Now, Nick said something earlier because you say this person has mental illness. Um, sometimes people just throw that word around. Sometimes they mean, no, literally, that person's been diagnosed with bipolar. And some of these behaviors kind of line up with that kind of diagnosis. Um It becomes interesting because I usually want to see you engage a person. I usually want to see you talk to them. I want to see you share with them. I feel like this whenever you speak to me like that. I feel hurt and I feel wounded. And being able to use those feeling words to get it across, that way you can start to draw these boundaries. Um, And even asserting yourself and saying, when you talk to me like this, I'm going to exit the conversation mm-hmm. and I'm not going to be cruel about it and I'm not going to be you know, silly about it and I'm not going to be childish about it, but I'm not available for conversations that sound like this. I'm not available to be spoken to this way, mom. You need to see me as an adult now. I'm 19 and I know we got to transition. We got to change our relationship. I'm not your child. I, I'm always going to be your child, but I'm not. I, I'm now your adult child and that has to look different than it used to. And so I want to see you stand up for yourself and make some assertions and draw what we call boundaries. And a boundary is when we teach somebody how we need to be treated in order to continue the relationship or in order to continue the version of the relationship that we have. And then imposing a consequence when that boundary is violated, imposing some kind of a sanction or a consequence or a result, whether that's I withdraw from the relationship or I'm not available for it or whatever, um, I want that to be something that you begin to experiment with. Because if you are stuck there for any further measure of time, um, we are going to have to sharpen some of these skills so that you can be successful with it. So I want to see you do that. I agree. I think setting good, healthy boundaries is going to be necessary. And it's it's kind of your way of just making it clear, like, this is not tolerable behavior. And you have the ability to exit that situation. Yeah. Great Thank question. You for in. Yes, and hang in there. And you know what? Don't be afraid to try. You're 19. The world is a big place. I know it's scary, but you're going to be okay. It gets better. And I want you to remember that. When you're 19 years old, you might not know that yet, but let me tell you, it gets better, okay? Hang in there. It's going to be all right. All right. So let's move on to the last part of the show. Oh, Apologies. here we go. Patreon reviews. Oh, God. Or Patreons and reviews. Yeah. Uh, so the apologies section, I guess I can just take a break because uh, uh, I've got nothing to apologize for. Yeah. 
Uh, what would you like to say, Jim? Oh, Lord. All right. So we get lots of letters. Um, sometimes people write in with, hey, here's our questions and, and here's some thoughts. Sometimes people write in with commentary and sometimes we'll read that on air or sometimes we'll write them back and say, hey, good point, and we just have a conversation. Um, but we got some mail this week, and so uh, we kind of set records uh, in email responses, and uh, the thing that everybody has in common is Jim is controversial. <laughs> so, all right, so I'm going to take my lumps. Um, I decided I want to read this letter uh, in its entirety in the show because I don't want to uh, be the kind of person who avoids uh, being critical about myself or, or receiving criticism. So, Nick, I, I Nick is smiling at me, enjoying Damn every right second of this. Uh, he's enjoying his pound of flesh. But Nick, uh, I've decided to be a good role model for our listeners and uh, demonstrate how to take criticism and to receive that. So you have the floor. Oh God, here we go. All right. So this letter comes in from Ulrich G. And uh, Ulrich G writes, "I've been listening to Pod Therapy since your Jock versus Nerd on Ice Cream Social." Thank you for listening. By Thank the way. you for listening. I, this week, I'm writing to call out Jim. Last week, episode 36, a listener wrote in for advice in setting boundaries and clarifying a relationship with a guy who wants more than friendship with a woman who doesn't. Early in the conversation, Jim says that there are three mistakes the listener could make, and number one is shutting him down hard. Jim explains that the reason some women do this is because some men don't listen and will keep right on pushing and pushing and pushing. And even though the listener describes the more subtle and polite things she's done to try to persuade the guy, Jim doesn't think it's okay for a woman to take a shot at a guy who wants more from her than she's willing to give. This would seem... This would seem like much more reasonable advice if Jim hadn't suggested just the opposite when the tables were turned. In episode 9, a male listener asked for advice on moving a relationship forward out of the friend zone, when the woman doesn't seem interested. In that case, Jim recommended negging. For those who don't know, negging is an act of emotional manipulation whereby a person makes a deliberate backhanded compliment or otherwise flirtatious remark to another person to undermine their confidence and increase their need of the manipulator's approval. Dude, seriously? Yes, you tried to redefine negging as something less toxic than it really is when you defined it in the episode, but that doesn't change the fact that your advice for men is just keep pushing those boundaries, and if being nice doesn't work, be a little meaner, while your advice to women is don't be mean when setting those boundaries. I think you can do better, Jim. (laughs) Oh, it hurts. So, uh... It hurts. Um, all right, G, I would just like to reply... I think you are 100% right on Damn everything it, except, a except for one thing. Okay. There's one thing that I disagree with the writer. Okay. Uh, at the very I'm end. better than this? <laughs> yes. At the very end, the writer puts that you can do better than this, Jim. I disagree. I think this is Jim at his best. <laughs> you go to hell. All right. I, I am going to reply to this. Um, so the first thing I want to say is this. Ulrich is one of my favorite people on Twitter. And and I think that this 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 critical email it, it's it's criticism it's it's well intended criticism you know I, I receive this not as hate mail I receive this as hey I'm I'm sincerely a listener and I found this to be incongruent and inconsistent and I don't like it and and I'm calling it out you know I want to see you do better than this so I take it as a positive. Um, but it was hard, Nick. It was hard for me to get because honestly, I really like Ulrich. Like we're Twitter buddies and like, we like all the same stuff and we're always commenting on each other's stuff. And, and it was hard because I was like, oh man, you know, I really thought this person thought I was awesome. And you know, they, maybe they still like me, but you know, they have some critical. So that was, that was hard to receive. I'm going to mostly take my lumps on this. Um, but I do want to reply just, you know, not, not with my defense, but just a little bit. I want you to understand something that, Whenever we reply to the letters that we get, our tendency as therapists is to reply in a microscopic way, usually. What that means is I'm usually replying to exactly what that person wrote, their very specific situation, as best as they were able to describe it, and trying to imagine the world through their shoes. Whenever Nick and I really do sessions with real people, 
a lot of it is us asking questions, a lot of questions, and learning and learning and learning and learning and learning. And if we have any advice or any feedback, it's usually very little, and it's usually at the very end. And we usually get like a solid hour to really grill and ask from every single dimension and every single perspective what's going on. Obviously, on this show, we don't get to do that. But what I think is important for everybody to understand is that whenever I give feedback, I'm often considering it from that person's perspective intrinsically. And I'm not trying to give feedback and say, this is how all people should behave everywhere as some kind of like Kantian categorical imperative. I'm saying this is what I think this person might be able to do. So last week we had a listener that wrote in and said, hey, um, guy at the gym is a friend of mine. I like him. We're friends. And he is a little flirtatious. And I want to say no, but it was very important to her to not lose the friendship. So my advice to her was, a mistake that you might make is putting this person on blast and being overly aggressive. I didn't want to see her do that because I didn't think it was going to get her to the goal that she wanted. And that's why my advice was specific. I wasn't saying all women everywhere should never, ever, ever press down the gas pedal and really push the message through. Sometimes you have to do that. But I also want your response to be proportionate to what you're sensing in the situation, right? Because you're humans, and I want you to have a nuanced and complex view of reality. Um, so there's that. But the other piece about negging, it's funny because last yesterday, Nick and I were having lunch, and I told you about this letter, and I said, dude, I knew that negging thing was going to come back to haunt yep. me. <laughs> and it did. So I'm going to take a look. I knew it when that. you said it. it you knew it was going to, yeah. Right. So back in the early days of the show, which, by the way, nobody should ever listen to episodes, I think, one through, what are we at, 37? Yeah, one, one through 36. Through 36. Yeah. <laughs> this is where you should start. <laughs> Everything else doesn't exist. It's a prequel. Um, but, <clears throat> no, it's true. But, no, episode nine, it was early in the game, and I was sort of, I think, still learning how to hone my therapist voice in this context when I can't see a patient in front of me. So I was kind of giving dating advice and saying, hey, you know, negging is something that works. And I was just sort of being playful. And, and, and um, you're right. I'm going to just take my lumps on that, that that kind of advice can be problematic and manipulative. And, um, yep, I'm just going to take it. So I'm just going to take that Very lump. Good. But that's, that's my reply. I like that, though. Thank you, All yeah. Reich, for writing in. Because yeah. I really, Makes me this a better is something... Person. This is something that I truly believe in. I no idea is above criticism. Yeah, no, I agree with I that too. Totally I totally believe that. I don't like the idea of sacred cows yeah. that we can't talk about or that are, are too touchy that we can't address. So it's fair. And I gotta you tell you, in. I am extremely flattered that we have listeners like this who a, have gone through the grueling and sad experience of listening to all the episodes. <laughs> and then being able to cite old episodes. And like only this. one. Yeah. <laughs> and wow. to only have one that they're like, hey, I have beef with this. Like, you know what? That's actually extremely generous. <laughs> I don't even remember what episode 36 was about. Yeah. <laughs> and I was here. Yeah. So that wasn't the only letter we got this week. We also got one from our pen pal from Brazil. Uh, she usually gives us some feedback after episodes, but there were some clips out of this one that I wanted to read as well. So this is from Manuela Mu. Zakio from Brazil. I nailed that. I actually wrote it phonetically this time. She wrote this. I tend to agree, and this is also about the um, how to deal with people that are interested in you, that you're not interested in them. She said, I tend to agree with being direct. Just say you're not interested. Women are nice, and people are always interpreting that as being flirtatious. The difference is that women understand the concept of no, and men think it's a challenge. Jim said it right. That's what men do, and that needs to stop. The thing is, women are basically trained to be nice all the time, and men just don't seem to be able to grasp the concept that the world does not revolve around them, and not every female is available to them. Men don't know how to deal with rejection. We've been observing this more and more lately, and women are blamed for it all the time. Whether you know this on a conscious level or not, if you are a woman, you certainly understand the expectations of society. You know you're not supposed to be rude or cause problems or make people upset. We carry around this weird obligation to be polite even to people that don't deserve our attention, and we don't realize it. We take it as a natural behavior. This means we are often finding ourselves in uncomfortable situations and not knowing how to get out of it. Because again, we can't hurt other people's feelings. We blame ourselves. We need to remember we do not owe anything to a random guy who seems to be interested. By the way, Jim, you're on fire this week. When you said the feminist in me, I sent you a telepathic hug. 
<laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Manu. <laughs> Appreciate you. But that's really good. I, I loved her feedback, Nick, because I think that that's something that you and I don't innately see, which is the burden of how women feel in society, that perhaps they have to be polite and they have to be kind. And, and it's really, really rude to be, you know, like rejecting or pushing people right. away. And that's a factor that we didn't think about whenever we were giving our advice. So yeah. really good feedback. Thank you. All right, and moving on to our Patreons. We want to send a thank you to our new Therapals. Yeah. Stacy Coleman, Nathan's Hot Dog Scoop, <laughs> Frozen 49th Scoop, all who gave us a dollar for, uh, who joined at a dollar a month level, uh, except for Robert Paulson, who gave two dollars a month. What? Show off. Show off. <laughs> it's so funny, because so, when I saw that, I was like, his name is Robert Paulson. You ever watch Fight Club? It's like a chant in Fight Club. His oh. name was Robert Paulson. No, I didn't. Yeah, I never, watch okay. Fight Club. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, somehow we figured out how to make it give $2. <laughs> so good job, That's Rob. That's cool. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, we also want to raise our glass to our second therapy producer. Yes. Jake Schneider. Jake Schneider. Uh, who's giving at the $20 a month level. And... No, 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 no. What? He's giving at $20 and, and one, one s- cent. He raised it a penny. And I think he's creating a trend now where it's going to be like an auction. And so we're only allowed to have eight there producers. That's how many we've created. And okay. so it'd be funny if the next one signs up. It's like, you know what? 20.02. Yeah, it could be like a <laughs> prices right. I'm going to be the, the highest there producer. Mm. <laughs> that way they get top billing. They're the executive <laughs> there producer. <laughs> so he will be contributing a message to next week's show uh, during our ad break uh, in future episodes as well, as well as receiving a producer credit on the show notes anytime his message appears if you want to hear sorry if you would like to hear this episode uncut and unedited with a special bonus feature before and after the show go to www.patreon.com therapy and join the party also on the page is a discussion about possible signature sign-offs we could do as well as uh, kinds of patreon perks for members uh, in the future so sign up and give us your feedback so we don't have any reviews uh, this week, Nick, but out there, if you would like to have your review read on air, you can give us a five-star, at a minimum, <laughs> review uh, at facebook.com slash podtherapy or on iTunes in the uh, Apple iTunes store. Anytime you guys give reviews that are five stars for us, we will read them on the show, and it's great because it makes uh, those systems see us as a better show, which means that they'll put it in other people's uh, suggestions feeds, and uh, that could really help somebody who might really need a show like this. That's all the time that we've got for this week's session. Thank you to those who contributed to our show today. We really appreciate it. Remember, pod therapy isn't something you should keep all to yourself. Help us reach others by sharing this episode. You can find us at facebook.com slash podtherapy, on Twitter at podtherapyguys, and now on Patreon at patreon.com slash therapy. Do you want to add your own advice to today's questions? Post your thoughts at podtherapy.net and join the conversation. I'm Nick Tangerman. I'm Jim Jobin. Thanks, and we'll see you for your appointment next week.